and also the administrative assistant for the Western region of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, an African-American organization that is LGBTQ friendly. And it's a, it's a religious organization. I'm actually happy to say that I belong to that organization as well. So today I give to you uh, the Reverend uh, Wilfred Moore, who's going to do our invocation. Good evening, everyone. Did you love that choir? Yeah. I want to put some framework into place. In the Holy Word, in the book of 1 Timothy, one of the major thrusts is praying for those who are in authority over us. Now, according to Paul's reasoning, we want good government that allows us to live peaceful and quiet lives. Is that right? Yeah. We're here today because we don't believe we should wait for a leader to be selected before we pray for them, before lifting him or her to God. Because as elected officials, we will need God's guidance to make appropriate decisions for the people of the United States of America. In prayer, we invite the Lord into the process of electing those leaders who will ultimately allow us to lead peaceful and quiet lives. Say peaceful. peaceful. We need some peace in this country. With that said, today we gather to give support to a man who has pledged to make democracy work. So, <laughs> we give support to a man to make it work even in the face of economic hardship and political scapegoating. Tom Steyer is his name. Tom Steyer has pledged to do what the present president wishes he could do, and that is to bring America together making it truly one nation under God. And say amen. Yeah. If you could join with me and bow your heads in prayer, I'm going to pray for this wonderful man. Gracious and eternal God, O oh God of all creation, we give thanksgiving and praise to you on this festive occasion. In the midst of headline news and uncertain times and constant debates, that in our future, we just have to come to you. Today we ask you to look upon this day with mercy as you come to lift the presidential hopeful, Mr. Tom Steyer. Bless us as we lift him up to you today. Let us all rededicate ourselves to this election process. Pray for Tom Steyer and those who are in leadership of our nation. We pray that Tom Steyer will take brave stands for righteousness even when it may not be well received. We pray for Tom Steyer's family, that they will be protected as he's going through this process. We ask you, O oh God, to surround him with your godly advisors. We pray, O oh God, that we pray that you will give him focus, to focus on the issues that we face as a nation today. And lastly, we ask you to help us to preserve the best of our past, and to be open to the new vision that he has for us. Fill this place with your presence and unite us as one in leadership. I ask these things, and we ask these things, in the name of Jesus, and we all say together, amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Moore. Round of applause for Reverend Moore and the choir. beautiful to look out to so many Nevadans. My name is Leslie Vega and I'm a regional organizing director uh, for the Northwest and Summerlin. Um, if you live in the Northwest and Summerlin, make sure you come and say hi to me. Let's become friends. Let's uh, make some action happen together. Um, it's going to take all of us to do our part, whether it's knocking doors, canvassing your own neighborhood, or volunteering at the upcoming Democratic Caucus in February. All of us have time, talent, and treasure to support this great candidate, Tom Steyer. So I'm here to present our state organizer, state director, Jaws Sida. I met her in 2016. Uh, she was organizing here, um, registering folks to vote, which is something really important. And uh, right now I wanna invite Jaws Sida to come here. Give us your applause. 
Uh, today my name is John Sida, and I am the state director for Tom Steyer here in Las Vegas and in Nevada. And it is a true pleasure and a true honor because I am living my American dream. I am able to be here in front of all of you today and see beautiful faces that are gonna support the next president of the United States. But I wouldn't be here alone. I wanna give a special shout out to my parents who are here today. My dad and my mom, my brother who's here. Uh, because without family and without a support, sometimes we can't achieve our dreams. But it's a true testament of the dreams that I follow. And one of the reasons that I support Tom Steyer is because he is bold and unapologetic. Because he stands for what he believes in. Because he walks the talk. Because he's someone that doesn't have to tell us that he's going to do something. But he is someone that has done already a lot and will continue to do so. It is my true pleasure and honor to be here before you. Some of you may not notice, but most of you are on top of our map of the state of Nevada. And uh, I wanted people to walk into this space and understand that yes, Las Vegas is a big part of Nevada, but isn't everything. We have a beautiful state that we are trying to bring back with democracy and to be able to win back the White House. It is the first in the West it is one of the most diverse states in the country, and we set the tone and the tenor of how we're gonna achieve and to winning back the White House. Because who here wants to take back the White House? Let me hear it. Who here wants to make sure that person in that house on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue hits the road? I want to give a special shout out to the artist who did this amazing painting. Vanessa, if you're in here, I think you're in here, Vanessa. I might not see you, but Vanessa, thank you so much for telling me she's back there. Thank you, Vanessa, for doing this. But this map is to remind us what we're fighting for. And it's to remind us what Tom Steyer is fighting for. And it is with great pleasure and honor that I live my American dream to introduce to you the next president of the United States, Tom Steyer. Yeah. You guys, I'm hoping this is actually gonna be a conversation and I'm gonna try and take as many questions as possible. I'm going to spend a few minutes just explaining why I'm running for president and a little bit about who I am. But Jaws was talking about the importance of family and my wife flew in today and I think she's got something to say first. Her name is Pat Taylor. Is it oh, there it goes. Thanks y'all. I'm Pat Taylor. I am thrilled to be here supporting Tom's candidacy for president, because we are all going to take back democracy of, for, and by the people. <laughs> these are not the best of times, but they're the only times I'll ever know. And I believe there is a time for meditation in cathedrals of our own. So when I see that mad surrender in Republican eyes, I won't stand aside and only sympathize. For we are always what our situation hands us. It's either sadness or euphoria. It's either sadness or euphoria. Would you see something? So look, I'm running for president for a very simple reason. And that is, we have a broken government in Washington, D.C. And I was list I'm the last person to get into this race. And I got in because I was listening to the debates and they were talking about all the different healthcare plans that we could do and all the different education plans and the different Green New Deals. And the truth is we're not getting any of it until we break the corporate stranglehold on yeah. our democracy. Yeah. 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 
corporations have bought the government. It's working perfectly for them. It just isn't working for the people of the United States. And so I felt like I'm gonna get in and level with the American people, which is, do we deserve health care, affordable health care as a right for every American? Of course we do. Every American knows that's a right in the 21st century. Do we deserve clean air and clean water? No one gets to poison us for profit. Of course we deserve it. Do we deserve quality education from pre-K through college? Yes, schools should not be for sale. And does every American deserve a living wage? One job is enough. Yes. That, those are the rights of Americans in the 21st century. It's just, we're not getting them until we beat these corporations. So job one is to beat the corporations. And so for the last 10 years, that's what I've been working at. Trying to organize coalitions of people just like the people in this room to take on unchecked corporate power. And a lot of it has been through propositions. You know, I started 10 years ago in California taking on the oil companies because no one else wanted to do it. Because everybody said they're too rich, they're too mean, you're gonna waste your time, and they're gonna kill you and make a fool of you. We got 70% of the vote against them. I took on the tobacco companies, they won 17 times in a row. We got three to four billion dollars worth of tax from them per year and gave it to Medi-Cal to support healthcare for the lowest income Californians. Yeah. We have, I fought for clean energy around the country, including in Nevada. Props, question six last year, 50% clean energy by 2030. I, it's kind of crazy. When do you see how much corporations control legislatures? It's crazy. You know, in California, they literally made a mistake. Gave corporations a mistake, a loophole worth a billion dollars a year. This really happened, and then they wouldn't close the loophole. And so we ran a prop to close the loophole, got a billion dollars a year, and gave it to the public schools. <laughs> the other thing that's been true is I have built one of the largest grassroots organizations in the United States, Next Gen America, and we're here. We're on college campuses all over Nevada. You know, we also made a deal with seven Next Gen plus seven national labor unions to go door to door together. In 2016, we got 15 million doors, including here in Nevada. And in 2018, we did 10 million doors. Next Gen did the largest youth voter mobilization, that's a mouthful, in 2018 in American history. We took 38 congressional districts that were controlled by Republicans. We more than doubled the output, the participation of young people, and we flipped 33 out of 38 districts. So, as an outsider, I have been taking on these corporations for 10 years, and I've been pushing for democracy, pushing power to the people. That really is what impeachment is. Impeachment is 8.3 million people who signed a petition to say to their elected representatives in Washington, do what's right. Don't do what's good for you. Do what's right. This isn't political convenience. Yeah. This is right and wrong in the United States of America. We have a crook in the White House. <laughs> it's not partisanship. It's patriotism. He's a bad man. Yeah. 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 And it, people said we're crazy. People said you're absolutely nuts. It's a liberal pipe dream. Look at where we are. Here we go. And if when they put on TV what he's done, the American people of every party, whether they support Trump or not, are gonna see who he is. And let's see whether Republican senators can stand up to their constituents once everybody realized what he's done and who he is. Yeah. So look, I know that when people describe me in the press, they always talk about me being rich. I know that. Right. So let me just take a second to tell you about who I really am. First of all, you just saw my wife. 
My wife is the CEO of a community bank that we started together. It was worth zero dollars when we started. We have over a billion dollars in it now. It's dedicated to economic justice, environmental sustainability, and supporting businesses owned by women and people of color. Yeah. Let me say, my wife is a stickler. We grade every single loan for impact on the community. Does it create jobs? Does it support low-income housing? Does it support ownership by women and people of color? Every single loan gets graded, and they, they've got to be good. And I'm like, I think it looks pretty good. And she's like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I think it looks okay. No, it isn't. So I'm just telling you, we are really serious about it. And she has done a fantastic job bringing money, bringing capital to those places on the West Coast where it isn't. We've said we want to be in every underserved urban and rural community to support the people starting businesses, owning homes that aren't supported by normal banks. So they redline these green ones. But let's get it. So my mom was a teacher. My mom taught in the New York public schools and she taught remedial reading at the Brooklyn House of Detention. Right. I love it. My dad was, the, was from New York, then left New York. My dad was the first generation in his family to go to college. My grandfather was a plumber. My father stopped his law career to go into the Navy in World War II, and he ended up prosecuting Nazis at the end at Nuremberg. And I don't think that's strange. They were the Depression era, World War II babies who thought you have to give back at least as much to this country as you get. They thought they were so lucky to be here. And that was what they taught us. And honestly, the way I asked him about prosecuting Nazis, and he said, when you see something really wrong in your society, at the heart of your society, you have to fight it early. And you have to fight it all the time before it really gets roots. That's what happened in Germany. And honestly, that was a big reason I started impeachment. I thought, right at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is something rotten. And if it gets its roots into the United States of America and we can't get rid of it, it's going to be terrible. Yep. Thank you. So, I started a business. I didn't inherit a dime from my parents. I started a business in one room with no employees, not even any windows in the room, and I built a pretty big international business. And I walked away from it. Kat and I took the giving pledge to give the bulk of our assets to good works, to charity, while we're alive. And since then, I've really been working with someone to push back for democracy. But the one thing I'll say is this. If Mr. Trump isn't thrown out of office, this is how he's going to run for president. He's going to say, I am a hateful man. I have said terrible things about women. I've said terrible things on uh, people based on race and ethnicity and sexual orientation. I have said loathsome things that no one should do. But I'm good on the economy. That's what he's going to run on. And let me say this. He was a fraud and a failure as a businessman. Yes, he was. He's a fraud and a failure as a steward of the American economy. And I just want a chance. You know, I was on Fox News two days ago, and we have this conversation, and they end by saying, but you can't deny that the employment rate, the unemployment rate is low, the stock market is booming, the economy is going great. And I said, really? You know what? The economy stinks for 90% of Americans. Yeah, that's right. You're saying there are a lot of jobs, but no one can live on those jobs. Right. You have, there are a lot of jobs. Most exactly. people have to have two jobs. Right. Three. You know, we're not talking Three. about jobs. We want to talk about wages. We want to talk about the cost of health care and right. rent and right. education. Right. You're telling us it's great because it's great for you. Yes. For the 90% of Americans, it stunk for 40 years. Yeah. And they, the proof that these corporations have bought the government is that all of the extra money over 40 years have gone to the biggest corporations and the richest people. Yeah. It's just the truth. And it's one thing to say the statistics, 
but when you go and see people who are really, really struggling, when you understand people are trying to decide, I can go to the doctor or I can pay rent. And I talked to those people, and you, you know, I had a mom in South Carolina who had a daughter with a potentially fatal disease. And she said, I can either take my daughter to the doctor, Tom, or I can pay rent. What am I gonna do? Deanna Berry. And I said, Deanna, I know what you're gonna do. You're taking your daughter to the doctor. And she goes, I am, but I don't know where I'm gonna be living on the first of the month. That's not right. That's right. And you know, I talk to people who are absolutely getting screwed in their work in terms of pay and overtime. They get fucked. You know, I was talking to these. <laughs> <laughs> Get out and meet human beings. It's not statistics. And so, you know, it's kind of like you hear the stories and, and you think about it academically and it's one thing. But when you see human beings get screwed over so that someone else can pay a lower tax rate, it just is wrong. And it's cruel. And it's w intentional and it's organized and we really have to end it. And that's why I'm running for president. things and then I want to take questions. One thing I want to say is this. Look, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I am a climate warrior. I've worked on it for more than a decade. I'm the only person running for president who will say this is my number one priority. We have to do it. That's the science. I'll declare a state of emergency on day one. But let me say a couple other things about this. First of all, I will start with leadership from the communities where we have concentrated air pollution and water pollution. All right. Because this, that's low income communities and communities of color. If we're gonna get this right, we're gonna go to those communities and make sure the policies deal with that. Second of all, if we do this, we're gonna have to rebuild America on an accelerated basis. We're gonna create literally millions of union jobs across this country. Amen. We're gonna push, we're gonna make sure people are decently paid and it's gonna be everywhere, and we're gonna to have to leave the world. This is not a problem that we can, can be solved within the borders of the United States of America. If there is not American moral leadership, financial leadership, technological leadership, and commercial leadership, it ain't happening. And there's no second choice. So what I'm saying to you on climate is simple. We have to do it. I promise we can do it. I promise you we can do this. And third of all, we can do it and be richer and healthier. But we're gonna have to try and we're gonna have to make it priority one, and I will. But it'll work for the people. And the last thing I wanna say before questions is this. And please think up some really hard questions. Pete, I was listening to these debates and everything sounded like a crisis. And I thought, it sounds like we live in a failed society. This is not a failed society. We have a failed government. We have the most successful society in the history of the world. If we take back this government, we will be able to have a guaranteed standard of living for every American better than people understand. We are rich enough, we have technology that is better than anyone's ever had, the things I was talking about in terms of health care and education and a living wage and clean air and clean water, we can guarantee as rights to every American and we will. That's not something we're going to have to reach for. That is going to be the foundation of community life in America. We're going to be in the best position of any people in the history of the planet Earth if we take back our government and start splitting things up fairly. That's what we're going to have to do. Okay, so I'm gonna try and answer as many questions as I can. I think, do we have someone going around with a microphone so people can be heard? Okay, and would you please introduce yourself so everybody can know your name? Yeah, my name is Doug Crawford. I'm here representing AARP Nevada. We have a campaign going to stop the pharmaceutical companies and their expensive drugs. 
and lower the prices. What are you going to do to help us do that? So is it Dunk? Doug. Doug. Yes. So look, when I talk about companies that have bought the government in Washington, D.C., there are no companies that are more egregious than the drug companies. Yep. And we all know this. I mean, I was with someone today whose wife requires insulin. We have 25 million diabetics in the United States of America. We pay 10 times as much for insulin as Canadians pay for. It was invented in 1930. This is not a new drug. They're just ripping us off. So let me answer your question, Dugga, with the preamble that we're going to have to beat these people. And in particular, they have stuff on the books that's hard to believe. Not only do they charge us 10 times what Canadians, they have a law that says you can't go to Canada to buy drugs. Yeah. They have a law that says the US government cannot negotiate drug prices. We're the only country in the world that doesn't negotiate drug prices. That's why we pay so much. That's right. So I'm gonna answer your question and I'm gonna put it in. Everyone's talking about, do you wanna do Medicare for all or a public option? I believe we definitely need to drive down prices and everyone has a right to healthcare in the United States of America. Amen. So all we're talking about, Doug, is what's the smartest way to beat these prices down? And I'm a person who believes in a public option. And I'll tell you why. There are 160 million people who've negotiated to get their health care through their employment. I want a public option where we get all the buying power of the federal government and negotiate with these people and force prices down. And we change the rules about like, not being able to go to Canada. And we change all the rules so that the, the federal government can negotiate prices down as hard as possible. But what I don't want to do is tell 160 million Americans, I know your health better than you know your health. I know your family's health better than you know your family's health. We're gonna make it really good if you keep doing your health care the way you're doing it, you're breaking the law. My attitude is, if the public option is so great, let them choose it. Let's leave choice with the American people. And let's make sure that choice is the best choice. So if they go to their employers and say, give me the money you're spending on my health care, and I'll go buy the public option. Yes. So that's my actual answer. Yes. Yes. So, uh, over here. Over here. I want to. Okay. Is there a lady right there? I want to ask him a question. Tom, I'm honored to meet you. What's your name, ma'am? My name is Jenny. What's my question? And this is kind of relates to infrastructure and climate crisis. And I was wondering if anyone in your organization has had any ideas uh, for a new industry that will touch everything, infrastructure, jobs, and preparedness for Americans for <coughs> natural disasters to come due to the climate crisis. Uh, an industry such as prefab homes for people who need shelter while their homes are destroyed, for example. So, Jane, when we think about climate, and our plan says this, we're going to have to do a lot of different things. One of the things we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna, we're in it now. We're gonna to have to be prepared for the things. Look, I'm from California. Our state's on fire. Our state's now on fire every fall. And we're gonna to have to be prepared to deal with those fires and not be surprised, because they're gonna happen every year. And I just came from Iowa, and Iowa has had three 500 year floods this decade. Yeah, oh my gosh. It's crazy. So we are going to have to be prepared for what we already have. And I can tell you that the rules on preparedness are $1 of preparation saves $7 once the problem arrives. That's the, so we should do it. But the other thing that's true is this. We're going to have to make sure that this doesn't get out of control. That's why I've said I declare a state of emergency. We're gonna to have to rebuild this country intelligently and sustainably, and it's gonna be all over the country. We're gonna to have to generate energy differently, which is why I pushed question six. 
We're going to have to generate it differently. We're going to have to use it differently. We're going to have to use it, you know, more. We're going to have to be more skillful in how we use it. But we can do this. I mean, I've spent literally over a decade looking, and I know that we have the technology. It will be cheaper. We will have cheaper renewable energy than any fossil fuel energy. We will live better. We will clean up the air and water in the places where we where we focused air pollution and people have asthma and water pollution where people get sick. We can do this. We also must do this. And we have to get going. And if we wait to convince the oil companies, we're going to wait way too long. We're just going to have to do it. And so Look, that's why I said state of emergency, because the Congress is 0 for 28 years on climate. 0 for nothing. So I, I said, I'll give them 100 days, three, a little over three months to do it. But I'm not holding my breath, and I'm not waiting. Because in fact, we're going to have to get going. It's going to be, it's going to be not just countrywide, it's going to be worldwide. The United States, look, we're going to redo the way Trump has positioned us in the world as a people who can't be trusted, who have no values, who have no allies, who have no coalition, who just fight everybody. We're gonna do the exact opposite. We're gonna lead the world again in what's right. Hi, my name's Marvin Hernandez, and my question for you is, how do you plan to impact the educational system in Nevada, which is ranked 50th in the country? Well, Marvin, we're going to have to get going. Let me say this about education. Right now, the Republican plan, look, the Republicans have a very simple playbook in the United States of America. It's true in Washington, D.C., and it's true in every Republican state. Where in every state, and I've done over 50 town halls across areas. the country on impeachment. No, such so I've been to all of the red states. And they do the same so. thing, and it yeah. specifically deals with what you're talking about, Mark. The first thing they do is they cut taxes on rich people and corporations. That's their first move. But their second move right, is to cut next. education. Thank you. The, they do it every single time. And the third move is to cut health care. And the fourth move is to attack working people and organized labor and they get to social security and the fifth is allow pollution as much pollution as you want to make as much money and if you kill some people you know that just happens <laughs> so what are we going to have to do in education look my mom was a teacher right <laughs> and i'm someone who studied what makes countries prosperous over time here's what makes pro countries prosperous over time effective citizens yeah. Investing in ourselves. We're America. Lake Tahoe is not America. The people of Nevada are America. So I want to invest in people, and that specifically means education. It's, this is something, if we're going to be a successful society, we have to think that when a kid in Las Vegas gets a good education and becomes a productive member of society and a good citizen, that's great for people in Kentucky and Maine and Florida. And when a kid in Appalachia gets a good education and becomes a productive member of society and a good citizen, that's good for the people of Las Vegas. And so, the two things I think about education, one, we've got to spend a lot more money on it, and we have to have a real plan of how to do it. Teachers deserve much more money. But that's not enough. We also need a plan to make it work. And the second thing is this, we all know that the way education gets paid for is local, it's by district. And we're gonna have to equalize that. It's, if you have unequal education by income level and by district, you are legislating inequality for the future. Amen. And the federal government has got to address that. That's not right. And so when we think about how we're gonna succeed, look, this, we're gonna succeed by investing in Americans. That's why Mr. Trump is so darn dumb. <laughs> and we're going to succeed by investing in all Americans. That's how we're going to Hi, Tom. First of all, I love what you're talking about with the banks. My name, name my name is Brian Harris. I'm the creator of the Independent Black Voters Group. Our vote is not free. Now, 
Good. It's about time. Yeah. Yeah. Now understand, America is only as strong as its weakest link. They say that by 2053, black America, not women, not anybody else, black America will have no wealth in the United States. We need access to capital. We need funds so we can strengthen predominantly or historically black communities. We need to strengthen the HBCUs. We need a plan that will give us a reason to vote for you. And you're halfway there now. <laughs> okay, right. That is rest talking about disparities in wealth. And the biggest way that Americans have built wealth over time is through their houses. That's how people have gotten rich is they bought a house, they've gotten a mortgage, over 30 years they've paid it down, and that's really the biggest savings plan in the United States of America, that and Social Security. And I've been, if you know the history of America, you know that banks literally had maps and they drew lines around African American communities and the word was no lending in the, inside the lines. And it's true and I've seen it and that's exactly why we started the bank was to do the opposite of that, to make sure we're lending inside the lines. But when we look at how we're gonna undo this, look, this, this was not just decades, this is centuries of organized legal discrimination and prejudice. And so in almost every single area of which that you look, there's an underlying aspect of it that's specifically about race. And if you talk about criminal justice, you can't talk about criminal justice in the United States without talking about race and redressing what's been wrong. That's right. When you look at housing, you can't talk about housing and not talk about race. You can't talk about education. It flows through every single thing. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves, we have to talk about it explicitly. You cannot talk about inequality in the United States and not talk about race. Because that means you're denying how we got here. Absolutely. We're denying rules that were open and accepted and totally unfair. And we're going to have to talk about how to redress that. And the only question is, do we go area by area or do we do it in one fell swoop? And I think we're going to have to have an explicit if I'm president, I promise we will have this. We will have a formal, explicit discussion of the last 400 years in the United States in regard to race. How we got here, what it means, and solutions in terms of what we have to do. It's long overdue, and I would do that, I guarantee you, as president. Thank you. So here the back here. Hi, Mr. Sire, my name is Lee Jackson, and I represent my husband and I own a local minority-owned business, Rethink Fabrics, and it's all about shirts made out of recycled plastic water bottles. No way, that's awesome. So, I'm an independent registered voter, but I believe in voting for the right person. So I'm very curious to hear what your, your plans are for the first 100 days when it comes to the environment. Okay. So. The question was, what are my plans for those? You don't even have to get to 100 days. So what did you think of First day, state of emergency on climate. I mean, we're going to go through and undo every single... Mr. Trump has never made a good environmental decision. Ever. Literally. He hasn't made any good decision. Every single thing he's done, we're going to undo. But it's got to be a lot more than that. I, I'm going to declare a state of emergency, and we're going to put in rules about how to generate power in the United States. We're going to put in rules about miles per gallon, what kind of cars have to be bought. We're going to put in building codes to make sure that buildings are much more efficient. We're going to put in rules to say to the... Look, I believe in the private sector. I just don't believe they should write the laws for us. I believe the, pe the government represents the people of, by, and for the people. We write the rules, they obey the rules. Yes. And that's what we're going to do. And let me say this. Is it me? Lee, I'm going to tell you a story. So in World War II, you know, the United States did no preparation for World War II after 1919 and the end of World War I. So when Pearl Harbor happened, we were way behind. You know, we didn't have tanks and we didn't have ships and we didn't have planes. So FDR went to the big three auto companies, which was basically the manufacturing capability in the United States. And he said, you're going to have to do this for us. We have to build all this stuff. We're going to have to catch up with the Germans and Japanese. 
and you're going to do it. So how much are you going to do for us? And they were Americans, they're patriotic Americans. They came back and said, we're going to devote 20% of our capacity to the war effort so we can win. And FDR said, okay, I have a different number in mind. <laughs> it will be 100% or I will shut you down. And that's my opinion about this. We're gonna have to make this happen and we're gonna put in rules to make sure that, this, that we hand on a safe, sustainable <coughs> country and world to our, the next generation. And it's gonna be, we're gonna put in rules to make sure that's true. Yes. This is, look, I'm the only person in this race who will say it's my number one priority. I'm not joking, I'm not messing around. Take a look at my record and see if anyone else has a record like mine in terms of fighting on this. Anybody. Here we go. Steyer, welcome to Nevada in the race. I'm Thank you. An honor to get a question. I'm Teresa. I'm a member of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And given that we lose 100 people a day to gun violence, uh, there were, uh, somebody was waving a gun around at the Target I frequent just the no other way. day. Yeah, I wasn't there, but it was. It, it's everywhere, and this our city was the site of the worst mass shooting in modern history. I'm aware. I know you are. And if you could please just tell us what is your plan for reducing gun violence. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's start with it is heartbreaking what's going on in the United States. And it's been going on for a long time. And it really, surprisingly, this is a perfect example of the corporate takeover of our government. Because over 90% of Americans would like mandatory background checks on every gun purchase. More Republicans want it than Democrats. 70% of NRA members want mandatory background checks on every gun purchase, and we still don't have it. And the reason is the gun manufacturers actually control the NRA, and the NRA won't let it happen. So what am I really talking about? What would I do? Of course I'm for background checks. Of course I'm for banning ARs and high capacity magazines. I'm for a voluntary buyback of guns around the country. If you really look state by state, states have their own gun laws and there's different concentration of guns by state. And what you see is in the states with fewer guns, there are fewer gun deaths. And it goes across the board. We all pay attention to the mass killings, the mass shootings, because they're in the press. We've had over 330 mass shootings this year. The country with the next most mass shootings in the world, number two is Mexico, with three. We're completely off the charts in mass shootings. But we know we also have a ton of domestic violence related to guns. We have neighborhoods where people are scared to go on the street. And 60% of gun-related deaths are suicides. So when we think about really what's going on in this society, overwhelmingly it's about too many guns in society and how do we get them back. And we've gone through and tried to come up with the most comprehensive program we can to make sure we get the worst kinds of guns off the street and that we reduce guns as much as possible. We do all the red flag laws and the things to try and make sure that the people who really shouldn't have guns don't have guns. But really what we need to do as a society is to reduce guns overall. Yep. And let me say, you know, Pat and I have a ranch. We give gun safety classes for free to anybody around who wants it because we know there are going to be guns in this country and we want people who own guns to be gun safe to understand how dangerous they are and to understand you have a responsibility you know we'd license gun owners just the way you license people who drive cars because you have a tool in your hands that's lethal so take your responsibility and know what you're doing and we register existing assault rifles assault rifles Tom, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for being the dream candidate. <laughs> You're too nice. What's your I'm, name, ma'am? My name is Mary Kathleen Cormack, or Chatty Kathy. Okay? 
and I have a lot to chat with you about, but not right now, okay? Um, one of the things I moved here to the state of Nevada, first of all, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, where my great-grandfather created the very first Democratic newspaper, okay? Right so I grew up in a, in a journalism family, okay? I became an actress when I was very young. I'm three days older than Donald Trump, but much wiser. I acted like he acted when I was like 12 years old, when I wanted the lead role, okay? But they didn't put up with me in that town, and they wouldn't put up with my nonsense, and so I learned my lessons early on, okay? That it's not all about me, 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 okay? Now, I have had a lot of businesses um, over the years. I've had a telephone company, five film production companies, two investment corporations. I moved here and I gave it all up and I said, what do I really want? What do I really want? And what I wanted was to find a way to live and work in an honest world, okay? Because I'm gonna have to create one because I can't find one to work with. And so that's why you're our candidate. I mean, we are now working